Well, yeah, and let me introduce myself traditionally. So my name is Dr. Aaron Thomas, Aaron Thomas, you can see it. And uh, Jimmy, Ms. Chalet, Fifth Lagana, I lost his key, Fifth Lagana, I lost uh, Dr. Che, and Happy Sock, you guys should know. So, for those of you unfamiliar, uh, now we'll usually introduce themselves and their clans. So, my parents' clans, my grandparents' clans. For those of you that are familiar, are probably like, oh, there are those, those Navajos, you know, selling us all this stuff, right? So, my uh, my, my dad's clan, uh, Sinai Jimmy, is the Black Street Wood people. My mom's clan, the Lagana, she's Caucasian, so that's our word for, for a white person. Uh, uh, also, my grandparents on my mom's side, of course, also Caucasian, but on my dad's side, my grandparents, Happy Sophomy, is the Tangle um, people. So that's sort of my, my background. So I want to talk to you a little bit today. I was asked to tell a little bit of my personal and educational journey, how I went from a little squirt to, uh, to a professor at a university, I'm also talking a little bit about some of the work I do with the tribe of Montana as well. So I'll kind of go through uh, most of that. But so when my I start usually my story about myself, I start of course with family. And I start with uh, my dad. So my dad grew up on an Navajo reservation. He was born in this Hogan right here, uh, which my grandparents actually lived in until about 15 years ago. So they lived in there almost all their lives until they got a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, so Navajo reservation. For well, those of you who are familiar, so here is Gallup, New Mexico, and just north is a town called Tlahatchee. Uh, and just off of that, about, I don't know, six or seven miles off the main road on a dirt road is where uh, their homestead is. Uh, there, right under where it says the Cheska Reservoir. So that's where my uh, dad grew up, that's where he was born. He always tells a joke for those that are unfamiliar with natives that the reason why he's so brown is because. Uh, they have a dirt floor in their house, and when he was born, his mom drops a rock on the floor. <laughs> and so it gets so dark because of all the dirt that got on him from um, after he was born. So when he grew up, his job, there he is, he was, his job was to herd sheep. So you might have heard a lot about Navajos and sheep, and it's, it's mostly true. Okay, uh, heard a lot of sheep, eat a lot of sheep. Um, my dad actually hates mutton to this day, and uh, I asked him why. And he says, because we had mutton for breakfast, and for lunch, and for dinner, growing up. That's all that he had. So he doesn't care for it nearly as much now as he did when he was a kid. So that was his job, was to go out with the sheep and to herd the sheep. Uh, he had a gun that he carried at, at this age, and he uh, used that and essentially to ward off the coyotes that came by to try to get, try to get the sheep. He went to boarding school. So the very first thing that... Um, where his parents sent him was boarding school. All of his older <laughs> brothers and sisters went to boarding school. He came from a kind of a large family. He came from a family of nine kids. He was the second youngest. Um, and he went to boarding school for probably about three months as a kindergartner, and he ran away. Hated it. Uh, they wouldn't let him speak his own language. Uh, he thought it was tough. And so he decided, this is it. I'm running away. So you can imagine a five-year-old kid walking, I don't know how many miles from where the boarding school was home. So his mom, my grandmother, kept him home for a year and then sent him back. I think by that time he was kind of adjusted and went back uh, then to boarding school. But of course, as you imagine, he has a lot of stories uh, about going to boarding school. One of my favorites that he tells me is um, uh, when he was in the lunchroom, they made sure that you ate everything that was on your plate. You couldn't leave anything, you couldn't throw out any food. And one of the things that was on there was a pat of butter. So you had to eat that butter, and he hated it. So all that he did with that was either try to hide it in his milk carton, or take that butter and stick it under the table, like that, okay? And to this day, he doesn't eat butter on anything. Uh, pancakes, bread, nothing. He just hates butter, mostly because of that. So, um, I also have a picture on here. So my grandmother, my grandmother's a, a weaver, um, so we wove uh, we'll a whole bunch of rugs, which partly went to use the sheep for too. So you carve the wool, you spin it, you make it into, um, use traditional dyes, and make it into rugs. So you're picture my grandmother um, and some of her rugs. Uh, fortunately, both my grandparents passed away uh, in about 10 years now. Um, but they, I know growing up, that's where we go. We go to the Hogans, to where they would stay, we bring them groceries. Um, they only spoke Navajo, they didn't speak any English at all, and my Navajo was not, not good. 
Um, it could be better. So it's essentially translated through my dad or through my aunts and uncles. Uh, I'll talk to my, to my grandparents about that. So uh, when my dad decided to go to college, he was the first of his family to go to college. He got on a bus in Gallup, New Mexico, and he went to school in Texas. So he got on that bus from Gallup and showed up in Texas, and the dean of the school came to meet him and said, it's great to have you here. Let me help you with your bags. And my dad said, this is it. He only had one bag. He <laughs> said, this is all I have, one small bag. And they said, okay, we need to go out and get you some supplies. So they went out and bought him like pens and paper and things like that. Um, and I hopefully he washed his clothes a lot because he just got a whole lot of clothes uh, that he brought with him. So he majored in welding engineering. So he be, actually became an engineer. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a welder. He still welds today. My welding stinks, uh, mostly because whenever I tried to weld, I would mess it up. And if you can imagine, if you messed up something in front of your father, uh, you got yelled at. And I got yelled at a lot because my welding was just not very good. So I decided to go do something else. So um, my mom uh, actually was born on the East Coast, my Asian mom. Her, my grandparents, her, her dad was actually a missionary to the Navajos. Came over to the reservation, that's kind of where my parents met. It was on the Navajo reservation. Um, my dad actually uh, won a lottery. Unfortunately, it was not the type of lottery you want to win. It was the draft lottery. Okay, so he was drafted during the Vietnam War. Um, if you are unfamiliar with how the draft worked, it kind of goes by your uh, birthday. So, you know, whenever your birthday was, that was essentially determined whether or not you were drafted. And apparently, his number was four. So he knew for sure that he was going to be drafted and go into the army. So that's where I kind of came along. I was actually born on an army base in Texas. Right there. So between Austin and Waco, Texas, and a place called Fort Hood, Texas, that's where I was born. Um, so my dad actually wasn't there when I was born. I think he was either in training or was deployed at the time. And um, they brought me to my mom. And of course, my mom is you know, pretty white, and I was pretty dark. And so they brought her my dark hair, and they looked at her band. Then they looked at my band. Then they checked her band again. And they simply said, you must look like your father. So um, I also got mixed up with this with another family. But it's a good thing that all worked out. So I actually lived in Texas for a little while. I uh, went to like first grade and second grade in El Paso, Texas. But really, I would consider my hometown to be in Albuquerque. So Albuquerque, New Mexico is essentially where I grew up. Uh, went through middle school and high school in Albuquerque. Uh, I played sports. I played uh, basketball, football, and volleyball. In fact, my goal as a probably a 10 year old was to play quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. That was my, that was my main goal. That was all I was working towards. And as you can see, that probably wasn't going to work out. Okay? <laughs> I was not nearly big enough. I could play football okay, um, but there was no way I was going to keep that as a career. Fortunately, I actually did pretty well in math and science and actually enjoyed those things. So when I got into high school, I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. And that was also partly due to my father. My dad was one of those that went in and if there was something to be fixed, he would at least try it first um, to try to fix it. Now, it didn't always work out. Sometimes you got to call someone else to, to fix whatever he tried to fix, but at least he made an attempt. And so I was always there to try to help to help fix things. So I knew I wanted to become an engineer, I just didn't know what type of engineer I wanted to be. And I thought, well, I kind of like chemistry. Chemistry was all right in high school, at least for me. So I'll become a chemical engineer. I'll put those two together and become a chemical engineer. I really, at that time, did not know what a chemical engineer was, but it seemed to combine two things that I thought were okay. So I went ahead and decided to be a chemical engineer, and I happened to be accepted into Stanford University, so that's on California. It's kind of in the Bay Area, okay? So San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland are all kind of in that area. Um, and so I decided to go there. Now, <coughs> that was far, far different than New Mexico, as you can imagine, California. Uh, things like, we'd be driving along, and it'd be, say, now entering um, Redwood City. 
And I'd be sitting there going, well, where did the other city end? I, I didn't even see where it ended. All the cities kind of ran together. I was so used to, okay, here's Albuquerque, up here is Santa Fe, um, over here is Gallup. They're all separate places. And in, in California, all the cities sort of ran together. I thought that was a little strange. Uh, big, crowded, um, it took me a little while to get used to what I was doing. I also had people who come to me and say things like, oh, the only reason why you're here is because you're a Native American. That's the only reason why you got it, right? And, oh, you don't even have to pay for college because you're Native American, right? You get all this for free, which of course is not true. However, I took some of that, uh, what they would tell me, and I essentially said, I don't care, right? Maybe, maybe one of the main reasons I got in here was because I'm Native American, but I'm here. So I'm gonna take full advantage of being here. So I did. So I didn't care what they said. I didn't really listen to them. I was somewhat on Navajo life and being a little arrogant, thinking I can do this. So um, I don't care what you tell me and I, I can figure this out. So I did. So some, that's what I sometimes tell students. You may feel like you don't belong there or you only got there for certain reasons, but you still have an opportunity. And so take advantage of the opportunity that's for setting that much in front of you anyway. Okay. Now, Chemical engineering, I still didn't know what it was. Um, I, I remember talking to someone and he asked, oh, what, was your, what are you studying? And I said, I'm studying chemical engineering. He's like, oh, you're gonna work in the oil fields. And I remember thinking, but, but I don't wanna work in the oil fields, right? I don't wanna do that. Is that the only thing that I can do as a chemical engineer? Well, it turns out there are many things you can do as a chemical engineer. Yes, oil is one of them, um, but you can also work um, for places like Intel or you can work for a national lab, or you can work uh, for a chemical company like uh, Dr. Cornelius does. There's a bunch of different areas then that you could work. Oh, speaking of Dr. Cornelius, I do also have a name um, background too. So my last name is Thomas. That doesn't sound like a common Navajo name. Why isn't it Begay or Sotia Chato or something like that? So I asked my dad, he says, well, why, 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 is my, why is our name Thomas? Why is it boring? Um, and so my aunts went and researched our family and it took it all the way back to Fort Sumner in New Mexico. And so she says, what happens? And she kind of put it in a funny way. She says, I'm sorry, uh, nephew, but we were the slow Navajos. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? We were slow Navajos. Said, well, the army came around and rounded up a whole bunch of Navajos and took them to Fort Sumner. And we were one of the slow ones and we were caught. <laughs> it's like, oh, great. Um, and so when we were taking the Fort Sumner, of course, you know, back then we didn't have last names. So we had no need for last names. We were just named whatever our grandparents named us or whatever after a couple of years um, to find who we were. So at Fort Sumner, they assigned last names. Okay, your last name is now this, your last name is now this, your last name is now that. And so Thomas, that's where that name came from. So our last name was actually assigned. Okay, so back. So I don't have any fancy, I, there's tons of Thomases, so the Cornelius thing was much better uh, than Dr. Cornelius thing. <laughs> uh, so, um, so back as an undergraduate, I actually got a couple of internships. I got an internship at Sandia National Labs, which also uh, Dr. Cornelius, that's where he worked for a little while. Also got an internship at um, Intel as well. And one main thing that those internships taught me is that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> it was a little strange. So I was in a cubicle in one area or I was working on a project and I wasn't totally interested in what they were doing. So, but in some ways that was valuable information to me in that it taught me that this is not the area I want to be in. I want to do something a little bit different. So I decided then to go to graduate school after that. My primary motivation to go to graduate school was because I didn't want to work yet. I still didn't, didn't know what it is I wanted to do or what company I wanted to work for. The two internships that I had were okay, um, but I didn't know what it is I wanted to do. So I decided I'll go hang out in graduate school for a master's degree. I'll go for a couple of years. That's what I'll do. What's nice about going to graduate school is if you're accepted into certain programs, uh, many of them will actually fly you out. And they'll try to convince you this is the best place for you to be. And you should come here and this is what we have to offer. So in some ways, those are kind of fun to go to. You feel, you feel needed. You feel like they're trying to sell themselves to you. So a couple of places that I went to, um, 
I went to um, Colorado School of Mines, so in Golden, Colorado. I, back then, I was a big um, snow skier. I, I skied a lot living in New Mexico. And of course, as you can imagine, the skiing in Colorado was awesome. Um, but then it worried me. The reason why it worried me is I thought, I'm just going to ski and never do work. Uh, so maybe I should choose someplace else to go. Another place I went to was uh, Notre Dame. So Notre Dame actually had me come out in March, and it was gray, and it was rainy, and it was cold. And growing up in New Mexico and living in California, that didn't appeal to me very much either. So I, I, these weren't the best reasons why I didn't choose to go to these schools, but these were what I was thinking. And the final place that they had me come out and visit was the University of Florida. In March, and it was sunny, and it was warm, and they took me out to play golf, even I had no idea how to play golf. Um, and I was like, yeah, I could see myself living out in Florida. It's a good thing I visited there in March and not in August, because it was hot when I moved there in August. So I decided I was going to head to the University of Florida. I was going to hang out for two years in graduate school, figure out what it is I wanted to do, and then go work somewhere. So I drove from uh, my place in Albuquerque, where my family lived and still lives, and drove cross country to Florida. Um, and like I said, I showed up and it was it was hot. It was far different than anything I ever expected. Uh, the, the house I was staying in was 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 with some other chemical engineering graduate students, and over the door was a huge spider web with a banana spider right in the middle. I'm just thinking, oh my goodness, where am I? And the parking lots. Uh, where we parked for school, you got to walk between these two ponds to get to our department, our building. And on one side of the pond was a 10 foot alligator that was sitting there sunning itself. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get eaten on one of these times. There's signs saying, you know, don't walk, don't walk through here at night because the alligators go from one pond to another pond. I'm like, oh my goodness, where am I? It's just far different than anything I've ever experienced. It was hot, it was humid, um, but the football. Football was really good at Florida. So those football games were tons of fun. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get my master's degree. I found an advisor to work for. In fact, the advisor I decided to work for, um, a lot of the other students were scared of him because um, they thought he was tough and they thought he was mean. Um, so he sort of encouraged me to be in his, in his program. And he turned out actually to be really good. I was very pleased to be a part of his research group. However, that first year in graduate school, I did not like the project I was on. I thought it was dull, I thought it was boring. Um, I just really wasn't all that interested in doing it. So, um, so I thought, oh man, I'm just gonna get this done and get out of here. Then I started to be a teaching assistant for a class, a chemical engineering class. So what that means is, so I would go there, I would go to the class, and then when students had questions, they would come to me. Okay, so some of you may be able to go to your professors uh, directly to get some help if you have help on homework assignments. But where I was, the students would actually come to me before they were going to the professors, and I'd help them with their different work. And I remember there was one student, he was from Haiti, he was Haitian, and he always come up to me and goes, Aaron, I need you to put some knowledge in me. I need some knowledge. I'm not understanding. Give me the knowledge. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you need help with? So we would sit down, we worked through these different problems. I could just tell he was struggling. And he'd come back you know, day after day, I need some knowledge, give me the knowledge I need. So I'm like, okay, let's work on it. And there was a point in there where I saw him actually figure out what was going on. I could see it in his face and the light, I could see the actual light come on. Cause he, he looked at it, we're working through this. And I said, and then you do this. And then this is why you're working on these things. And it clicked with him and he started to smile and he goes, I, I get it. I got the knowledge. I understand what to do now. And I, from there on, I thought, I, I want to teach. I want to be with students. This is awesome. I want to help them understand chemical engineering. So then I went ahead and decided to go ahead, forget the master's. I want to get the PhD so I can teach college level. So I went straight through. I actually never did get my master's degree. I went straight through and got my PhD in uh, chemical engineering. Still stayed in chemical engineering, even though I wasn't totally sure what that was going to be. 
Um, I grew into my project. I actually really enjoyed my projects after um, that first year, which was kind of hard. It was just a lot of math, a lot of experience, uh, experiments, um, but it turned out to be really good. And my advisor was my biggest advocate when I was trying to find a job. Um, so I was really appreciative for him. And I tell any student that goes on to graduate school, which hopefully you guys are heading that direction maybe someday, that it's actually much better to choose a good advisor than necessarily a good project. Because your advisor will help you um, navigate some of the difficulties and you can sort of grow into your project in a similar way that I grew into my project. So I went ahead and decided that I'm going to go uh, teach somewhere at some school. I had several offers, uh, like from the University of Alabama, they wanted me to go there. Uh, Mississippi State was one of those. Um, but I decided to go to the University of Idaho. All the way up there. So I moved. We drove from Gainesville, Florida to Moscow, Idaho. Five days. Five days it took. At that time, I was married. I got married in graduate school. We had two kids in graduate school as well. Um, so what I did uh, with, when I told my wife that I had an interview in Idaho, she goes, I don't think anybody lives in Idaho. <laughs> uh, there's no one in Idaho. And I said, well, yeah, they are. And they actually flew both of us out. They flew her out along with me. Um, and she goes, we're going to get off the airplane and go, oh, no, no, no. You know what? It was almost exactly that way. <laughs> Moscow, Idaho was just like a little one, smaller than the Lincoln Airport, just a little one gate, and you got off, and there was, you know, nothing. You had to, like, step down and then walk over to where the airport was. And it was kind of like, there's no one that lives here. There's no one here at all. It was barren. It was barren. Yes, there was hardly anybody there. So that was kind of funny. But I convinced her. Uh, that this is where I wanted to be. And so part of it was so I could get out of the South because it was hot and humid and I needed mountains again growing up in New Mexico. Uh, so we we drove that whole way. Uh, we use a, a, a little bit of a strong word. I actually had her drive to her parents' place. Her parents lived in um, Kentucky at the time. So I had her drive her, oh, actually I flew her and our two kids up to Kentucky. I had my dad come and help me drive all the way back. And we both had to drive. He was driving our, uh, we had a moving van and we had our car. We both drove the entire way all the way back. In fact, after the fourth night, we were in Casper, Wyoming. And I got up that morning and I went, Dad, I can't drive anymore. This is just too far. And he goes, well, I'm sure there's a place here you can teach. And I went, okay, let's get in the car. Just, you know, let's just keep going, okay? Because there wasn't much in Casper, Wyoming at that time. You know that the population, the population of Wyoming is equivalent to the population of Lincoln? Yes, it's all. Mm -hmm. Well, and get this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so it's not much better in Montana. So the entire population of Montana is less than one million. So, what's that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not boring. Idaho is a little bit different. Idaho is a little bit bigger, except Moscow, Idaho, it was, it was pretty barren. Uh, I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, so we had another another kid there. So I have a daughter uh, who's going to school in Arizona. I have a son who's going to school in New York. Uh, and I have my youngest son is still in high school. And so he's with us. But we raised all three of those kids in Idaho. There was a point where I decided I needed to change. Okay. I needed to do something a little bit different, and I wanted to work more with uh, tribes as well. So that then brought me, it was a long journey. <laughs> that then brought me to Missoula, Montana, the University of Montana. And so it's there where I began uh, my work primarily with the, uh, the, the reservations and the tribal colleges uh, in Montana. And so moved my entire family there. They were actually pretty sad to leave Idaho. Uh, they really grew uh, close to their friends and to the area. Uh, but I think they're really enjoying Montana now as well. So, a little bit of background on my educational and personal journey. Oh, uh, I'm going to tell you just real quickly, real quickly, a little bit of the science that I do. Okay, <coughs> this, this won't take long. So, some of the science that I do is I also work with separations, and so we do separations 
uh, mechanically. So our, our idea is, is if we use a, an oscillation, a flow oscillation, kind of like, like an ocean wave or like what happens to your blood, like a pulse, okay, can we use that as a mechanical separation mechanism? And the answer is yes, yes you can. So the way I, I explain this is if you can imagine I have like two reservoirs or, or two tanks, and they're all connected by a long tube. Okay, so in one tank, in both tanks I have nitrogen in it, but in one tank I have nitrogen plus a small amount of another gas. It's called like carbon dioxide, okay? I have it in the other tank. Now, if I left everything alone, that carbon dioxide will go from this tank to this tank through that tube because of diffusion, okay? Things diffuse out. You can kind of see that if we had a big bottle of perfume in here and I took the cap off, eventually you would smell it is it's going to diffuse towards you. It's going to go an area from high concentration to areas of low concentration, okay? So that's this top one right there, okay? So the yellow would sort of represent the CO2 moving from one tank to another. Now, if I do a flow pulse, like if I do a push of the fluid in one direction over here, well, that CO2 would, be, uh, would move down the tube, but also diffuse towards the boundary across that kind of that red uh, pulse right there, it diffuses down and towards the boundary. Now what's key about that is if you're at the boundary towards the edges, that's where the fluid is the slowest, okay? So on the reverse pulse, okay, the fluid is pretty slow there, but then it'll start to diffuse towards the middle so that it can take the next pulse, you can vector it down the tube, diffuse towards the boundary and start the whole process again. So what happens is, is you get species that kind of goes from center to boundary to center, kind of in a zigzag fashion, all the way down the tube. So you can increase the transport or the throughput of species, even though there's no net flow, right? So if it's purely oscillatory, okay, there's gonna be no net flow from one tank to the other, but you'll get a lot of throughput of that CO2 from one end to the other. Now, if I put another mixture in here, let's say CO2 and helium in there, well, they're both gonna transport or at different rates. Some are going to be faster than others. It's going to be also depend on how fast you oscillate. Okay? So all that combined can give you a mechanical separation mechanism. And in fact, okay, one of the ideas of how we can use this is for manned space missions. So let's say you're going up to, to Mars someday, you're one of the astronauts chosen, you're the next John Harrington perhaps heading up to Mars, okay? And so as you can imagine, you breathe out <coughs> CO2. Well, that CO2 has to be removed and revitalized so that you can get oxygen back into your system, okay? Well, we do it here on this planet. CO2 goes to the trees and the plants. They convert that to oxygen, you breathe that in and everything's good. But if you're in an enclosed space, okay, that's a little bit harder. Who here has seen the movie uh, Apollo 13? Some of you have, a little bit. Okay, so remember there's one part where they had the membrane and they had to replace the square membrane in the round hole and they had to somehow engineer how they were going to do that? Well, it was those membranes were the CO2 membranes, okay? And so if you're going on a long mission, you have to bring up a whole bunch of membranes that have to be regenerated. Well, this way, it's purely mechanical. So our idea is you, you breathe out the CO2 and we have uh, water vapor come in. We can separate out that CO2, condense out the water vapor, send the uh, carbon dioxide to plants that are on board for regeneration, and then send the revitalized air back to human systems. So that's what we proposed to NASA. We could do this and actually send some funding and we worked on this project for some time. But you can do this with a whole bunch of different things, okay? A whole bunch of different separations of both gases and liquids. And it's really dependent on three primary parameters. One is the diffusion coefficient, how fast something moves, through medium, so helium would, would typically move faster than CO2 would, because helium is smaller. Kinematic viscosity, these are, these are some technical words, that's how fast something in response to a perturbation. So in other words, if I have a piston that's moving air, well how fast does that air respond to that piston pushing it back and forth? So that's also key, kinematic viscosity. The periodicity, how fast you oscillate, okay? Are you oscillating real fast or are you oscillating real slow? That also dictates how much separation you make. 
So it's really how the species is able to remain in faster moving regions as opposed to slower moving regions as the fluid flows. That dictates your separation. And the final thing, we can use this for biological separations. You can separate out proteins. You can separate out cells and DNA. But then you have to shrink your dimensions. So all that has to be done on like a microchip instead. So we have some work trying to use the same technology <laughs> doing it on the microchip scale. Okay, that's some of just technical background to things we're working on. So my primary reason for moving to Montana was to oversee this program and become the director of Indigenous Research and STEM Education. And really, as you can see here, this is this is our mission statement. So we're dedicated to advancing the Native American, Alaska Native, and Hawaiian First Nation students in STEM in both their academic disciplines and professions. And our idea is how can we get more Native students to get their degrees in, in these areas and also um, develop tribal communities so that they can support students that have these degrees and support their own economic uh, development as well. So some of the things that we work with, and I'll go through some of these. Um, ideally, trying to get students to get their graduate degrees in, uh, in, in STEM fields for, for Native students. Uh, but I notice if I just sit there and wait for Native students to show up at my doorstep <laughs> to get their graduate degrees, uh, that doesn't work very well. So I need to reach down into undergraduates and even to the K through 12 level. So really working on Native education, we call it K through grade. So kindergarten through grandmothers and grandfathers, right? So all those can be involved in getting their education in uh, STEM fields. So I specifically, I, I try to build relationships with both the tribes and the tribal colleges in Montana. I'll kind of go over our demographics here in a moment. And looking to, again, work towards the betterment of all indigenous peoples, um, especially in the state of Montana. So here's a map of Montana. We have seven reservations in Montana representing 10 different federally recognized tribes. We also have one state recognized tribe as well. So you can see where the reservations are located. Um, the University of Montana, Missoula, right there. Okay, so that's where I'm located. Um, when Dr. Cornelius was talking to Billings, Billings is right there. He went to school at Montana State, which is right there in Bozeman. Okay, Dr. Yellow Rope, when she was talking last night, saying she was going to try out. So right there, uh, where her uh, reservation is located. And so you can see it's, it's spread out uh, quite a bit across the state. The driving time from Missoula to Wolf Point at Fort Peck is 10 hours. Um, I've, I've driven that many, many times. Uh, really, I have to come down here through Billings, not on up to Fort Peck, so that's a 10-hour drive to get essentially from one quarter of the state to the other quarter of the state. Um, I've visited all the reservations on a number of occasions. I can drive over 2,000 miles and never leave Montana. Uh, so it, it's quite a, quite a big area. Uh, I'm sure Nebraska is similar, the Dakotas are similar, we just have, we just have big states. There's a lot of driving involved uh, with these states. <coughs> What's that? What for? Uh, oh, okay. Olson's nice area. Yeah, it's on the lake. So he's talking about the <coughs> which is right on the Flathead Reservation, and it's right next to what's called Flathead Lake, huge mountain lake. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. From here? <laughs> well, good ways. Yeah. Well, the problem is, if you get to Montana, like Billings, you think, oh, we're almost there. And it's still like another seven hours yeah. driving after that. So each one of these reservations has a tribal college. Okay. So there's seven tribal colleges in Montana. Uh, most of them are two-year tribal colleges, two-year degrees. However, we have one, Salish Kootenai College, that actually offers uh, four-year degrees as well. So, one of my goals in working with students uh, is I have noticed, with our, especially with our Native students, that one of the main hindrances to them graduating with a four-year degree has been math. So preparations in math seem to be uh, the main obstacle for students. Right behind that is probably writing. Okay? Uh, writing is also an issue with our Native students as well in Montana. 
So one of my goals then is to help students prepare both in middle school and high school before they step on college campuses instead of trying to remediate them once they're there. Because we tend to lose a lot of students trying to take remedial math classes, remedial writing classes, and then after their first semester, they, they say, this is not for me. I'm not even getting credit for any of these classes because there are no credit classes, so I'm going to go do something else. Okay. So my goal is to help them prepare because they can, they can take those classes in high school. Um, we can work with them and have them um, then go ahead and take the right classes then in college. The other thing that I do is I try to help other researchers become involved with the tribal communities. Now, a lot of what I'm going to present next probably makes sense to you. It makes sense to us uh, because this is the way that we work. But when we're working with tribal communities, I try to tell others, um, we need to build our relationships with these tribal communities. And these take time. And I'm not talking about a couple of weeks. It could take years. So being Navajo in Montana, um, it's taken me a little while to make relationships with the tribes in Montana since I'm not originally from here. Um, in some ways, it's actually worked a little bit better because there's still some history between the tribes of Montana. So for example, if I was Blackfeet and I went to Crow country, um, th there might be a little bit of an issue there because they were uh, traditional enemies and there's still a little bit of history between the Blackfeet and the Crow. Um, and really, what are your intentions when you're working with tribes? What are you trying to do? And so I try to tell them that, again, this might all make sense to you, is is you should really base your interactions with tribal communities on what I would call the four R's. So the first R to work with tribal communities is respect. We are knowing that we are we are sovereign nations. And so when they come to us, they know that they're working with a sovereign nation. Self-determination is involved. Making our own decisions that it's best for all for our own community. And we have generational knowledge. We don't just have historical knowledge. We have knowledge that goes back generations. We've been on this land um, for, for a long time, for time immemorial in many cases. Okay, Where our first man, of course, the first woman came is from these areas. So we have the knowledge of, of uh, what's going on in, 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 these, in these regions. And sometimes that's not acknowledged or even recognized. And just because it's not written down, because it's just passed on orally from our elders and from our grandparents, doesn't mean it's any less significant than if it was found in a journal. So knowing that each tribe has this type of, of knowledge, has this type of um, connection to the land, uh, garners respect from those that are, that are looking to make uh, relationships. Again, relationships need to build trust. This will take time. Um, you can't just go in there for one year, get, get all the information you need. Need and then leave. Okay, that's not the way that, that we're going to work um, anymore. What are your intentions? Are you in there quickly and then are quickly out, just getting what you want and then taking off? Okay, that should not be the case. Responsibility. We need to take our communities into context when we look at our research. What's the benefit to the community? Not necessarily what's the benefit for you getting your tenure or for you writing your publications or for you getting all the credit. But what's the benefits for you getting uh, involvement in the community? And reciprocity. So many times, the, the big universities will come to the tribal colleges and say, okay, we can do this for you, you should do this, and uh, we have all this money for you to handle this. And the tribal could be like, oh, but we don't want to do this. This is not what we decide what we want to do. We want to do something different. Here are our needs. And not only that, here's what we can provide to you. Okay. You may think that you have all the answers, but we have the answers already that you can use as well. So not only what are you providing to them, but what are they providing to you? What type of special skills can um, the tribal colleges and these schools provide to you and how can you work together on these things? <laughs> so again, you probably know that this all makes sense to us, uh, but that teaching these to other researchers is quite important. So I tell people then, well, they said, well, how, how do we do this? You know, how do we start building relationships? How do we start building trust? Well, the best way to do it, in my opinion, is not through a phone call or through an email. Okay, it's getting in the car. Road trip. That's right. Get in the car and start visiting. That's one of the very first things I did when I was in Montana. I just got in the car and I started driving to the different uh, travel colleges, different reservations, and just listened. 
So my big thing was not to come and say, I have this for you and I have that for you. Um, I have this program, I have that program. It was more, what do you need and how can we help? And they, they eventually told me, this is the areas that we need. So road trip, find ways to visit these travel communities and begin these conversations. Okay, listen to the needs that are in these places. Um, and you might have this project in mind, think this would be the best thing for uh, the Crow Nation. And the Crow Nation comes back and tells you, nope, this is what we need instead. So you might have to modify your project based on what you feel or what they indicate what their needs are. Okay, so I'll get through the final part of this. So I kind of tell you some of the activities that I do through not only being a faculty member, so I teach engineering classes, but I also work quite a bit with trying to prepare students again, like I said, for college, starting in the middle school level. So we have different programs that we have working with students. The so one that I started was called Science is Cool Montana, called Stick'em. Um, this is what happens when you leave acronyms up to me, because I am not very good at them, okay? I'm actually kind of terrible. Uh, so Stick'em is what we call this one. Uh, and so what we did is we took, uh, we did week-long day uh, science camps to the different reservation communities. And I brought students from the University of Montana, mostly native, native graduate students to come help me. And it was through Hira. Uh, there might be Hira up in Nebraska. So I worked with Hira up in Montana, and we did these long uh, camps at the different communities. So Browning, uh, the Blackfeet Reservation, Harlem, uh, Port Belknap, Pardin, Crow Agency, and Lane Beers, Northern Cheyenne. So we went in and did different things. We did, um, we did hot air balloons, we did rocket launches. So here's the hot air balloons here, okay? We made them out of, um, out of Tissue paper, that's what the hot air balloons were made out of. We did rocket launches. There were rocket launches there and rocket launches there that we went ahead and did with the students. Yeah. What did you use for the hot air? The hot air? Yeah. So this is a stove pipe mm. that I put together and we took some rags, and we filled them up with kerosene, and put the rags underneath and lit it. Okay, which the students of course think is awesome. When you have, whenever you have fire. <laughs> and sometimes those flames would come out of the top. And so you put your tissue paper balloon over the top, and sometimes it just catches on fire. And they actually think that's awesome too. And you just have to let it go. You can't really put it out. You just say, okay, we'll just have to let it, you know, burn up. And everyone's sharing. They think it's great. Yeah. How did they get all the tissue paper together? Sure. So what we had is uh, we just used glue uh, to have it stick together. So. Um, um, uh, Glue sticks is what we use. We just glue them together. So what I have is, so you put those three three tissue paper panels together, glue them, glue them together. You fold it over, and I have a template. And the template kind of looks like kind of like an airplane wing, like that. And then you open that up, and then you glue all those together, so it's all round. And then um, you cover the top, and you have an opening at the bottom, and they actually go pretty well. So as you can see. Right? Yeah, they go pretty high. They go pretty high. Okay. It sort of depends on how cold it is and how windy it is, too. Um, rockets, we make rockets out of cardstock and we use um, we use pressure. So these little, as you can see up there, we have a little pump and we pump up this container and then we release the valve and those rockets go shooting off. And of course, we do a contest to see how far, who's the farthest rocket, and they all get excited about that because I give them candy, which always helps. Are we gonna make rockets? <laughs> <laughs> you wanna do rockets in here now? Yeah. It's actually a lot of fun. We probably should. Have time. I'll, I'll bring my little rocket launcher and other balloons. Is there a On your forehead, you're a balloon. What are you talking about? Never mind. The other thing we did with middle school students is we did computer builds. So I would bring just all the parts to the computer. Um, I got this idea from the University of Alaska. They have a program up there, which I think is one of the best that in getting native, uh, Alaska Native students through uh, STEM fields. One of the things they do with students, they have them build computers. And what I mean by that is you have a case, separate, you have your power supply, separate, you have your motherboard, and you have them put that computer together all by themselves. And they're, of course, naturally all freaked out. It's like, I have to put together my computers. I guess. Well, I don't know how they work. Well, we're going to learn. Um, and so we go step by step. 
First, we put in the power supply. Then you put in the motherboard. And we just go step by step with them on how to put everything together. So they build their very own computers. And I tell them, that computer that you've built, you can keep. However, you have to pass Algebra 1 <laughs> by either 8th or ninth grade. And the idea is, is, if you pass Algebra 1 by 8th or ninth grade, then that sets you up in high school to then take things like trigonometry, maybe calculus. If you get through trigonometry in high school, then you are most likely going to do well once you come into college. If you at least get to that point, okay. You could call credit too. Yes, that's very true. So by the end of this, they they know how computer works. So if I tell them, hey, if you wanted to add another hard drive to your computer, could you do that? They go, yeah. If you want to put more memory in your computer, could you do that? They go, yeah. We know how to do this now. So it's really an awesome thing to see them go from, I have no idea how to do this, this is scary, to, oh, this is really cool. Part of the problem with this is um, not very many people have desktop computers anymore, right? So now things are going to laptops or to iPads or those sort of things. We might have to figure out. Do you think just have to make your own That would be awesome. <laughs> if I knew how to do that, just have all the parts and just put it together. I'll, I'll, I'll have to work on that. But I think that would be cool if we could do something like that. Yes. Um, this fall, I'm actually starting a new program on the Flathead Reservation. That was the one that was very closest to Missoula, where Polson is, just, just right off. And we're going to reinstitute science fairs with the middle school students. A lot of the middle school students have never done a science fair project. Actually, <laughs> who in here has, has done a science fair project? Only a few, right? So a lot of these places, no one's ever done a science fair project. So we're going to start those at four schools, four middle schools on the Flathead Reservation. We're going to have someone come and help them with their science fair project. So it's not like either just up to them or have their parents do it for them. Okay. We're going to have someone come and work with them to do their science fair project. We're going to have mentors from the local tribal college and the University of Montana help them with their science fair project and meet with them once or twice a month. What really gets them excited is I tell them that uh, at the end of each month that you're making good progress on your science fair project and you are um, doing well in your classes, I'll give you 20 bucks. So I give them a $20 stipend at the end of each month. And you can see how excited middle school students know they're going to get 20 bucks. Like, yeah, we can use that. Can we buy this? Buy that? Actually, one kid goes, could you hold on to the $20 until the very end? Of the year, I was like, why? Well, because I'll just spend it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm not really a bank, so I might spend it too. Um, and then he was pretty little worried about that. So, um, the other thing we're going to do for them is so there's going to be a science fair uh, uh, display uh, presentation at the local travel college from all these four schools. And I'll have judges coming around and they'll choose the top two or three projects. And I'll take those students on a field trip to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so they get really excited about potentially going to Los Angeles, California. And I love asking them, um, like, what do you know what's in Los Angeles? And the two craziest answers I got was, there's police in Los Angeles. And I'm like, yeah, but there's police in Rodan too, so I don't know why you are interested in that. <laughs> and they think there's casinos in Los Angeles, and they're all excited about that. I'm like, that's Las Vegas. Yes, that's not quite Los Angeles. Um, so this will be good. So this is our first year in doing that. So I'm excited to take some students down to California to see the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. That's where they build the Mars rovers, like Curiosity and all that. That's kind of where they put all those together. We're just starting those, but it's going to be projects that are important to the reservation. So community-based projects. Yeah, I think it'll be good. Okay, so that's middle school. So high school, I have a little bit of a gap. I'm working towards that. But right now, what we have done is we do these uh, these bridge programs. So if you graduate as a senior in high school and before you start your freshman year um, at college, we have some bridge programs we do for students. Uh, so we did 2016. Um, we had a, a good group. And I sort of invited any Students, either if you're coming to the University of Montana, Montana, or Montana State, or going to a travel college, 
he could be part of this bridge program. And so we, we had them take classes in math, in writing, and also in study skills. And our main goal is to try to get them prepared again before they come on campus um, instead of struggling through it once they're there. Did, did they get test level credits for doing that? Our classes weren't long enough to do credits. Otherwise, I would have done it. If I had more money, I would have made a lot better gave them credits to do that. Because that, that, that was an important question. Undergraduate students. So, have any of you in here heard of an REU, this term before? So this is an NSF program. REU stands for Research Experience for Undergraduates. And so it's open to any undergraduate students. And they're all over the country, okay? So if you ever want to find a research project or a research area you want to do, um, you can look up um, REUs through the National Science Foundation, and you can probably have your choice of where you want to go. Okay, you can just apply, say that you're native, they might only take you because you said you're native, who cares? Just go, take advantage of the opportunity that's presented before you, and do some research on another campus. So we hosted actually students from tribal colleges that were part of our program. Uh, we originally said we wanted half of our uh, program for participants to be native, and it turned out over three years, um, 16 out of our 18 um, participants were actually native students from the tribal colleges. So it was pretty good. We were glad to host those students to be a part of that program. So we had them do environmental chemistry type research. I also work with graduate students. So here's an awesome graduate student, in my opinion. I have, I very, I have a number of them that are, are great. Uh, this is Ronalda. She's also Navajo as well. Um, I, I take a Navajo class from her uh, because I, I just need help, and she's very good at it. Uh, she was Miss Northern Navajo. Uh, that all, that helps. Um, that's a demonstration of cultural knowledge, traditional practice, language fluency. She's getting her PhD in interdisciplinary studies, although it is essentially chemistry what she's doing, and some of the work that she does is study water quality remediation because of all the uranium mining that happened on the Navajo Reservation. So even though she's in Montana, she's still doing studies on, in, her, in her home area on the Navajo Reservation. So that's another possibility too. So just because you're in one area or one school that might be far away, you can still do work that's important to your community. She'll be graduating here in the spring, and she's going to be one of the superstars. I'm, I'm sure of it when she's done. You'll, you'll hear about her in other places. Um, I also have a lab that I dedicate specifically to any Native student that needs lab space. If you need access to a hood, to glassware, to a lab bench, to some place to sit, I have a lab that's open for you. You can be a part of that. A couple of others. Something to consider once, again, you get your four-year degree and decide to go to graduate school. There's something called the Sloan Indigenous Graduate Partnership. It's for any Native student that attends one of four, one of four uh, schools or four states. University of Montana, Montana Tech, Montana State, Purdue, Arizona, and Alaska, and it's money to go to graduate school. And so what it is, is we'll give you, uh, in addition to whatever research that you have, for a master's student, we'll give you $20,000, and for a PhD student, yeah. we'll give you $40,000 to complete your program. So it's a great way to not have to take a second job, because we understand that if you go to graduate school, you may not be alone. You may have a family that you bring with you. And so this is to help offset some of those costs that you may have um, associated with, with bringing a family. We also did a program called the Pacific Northwest Alliance. And there's a big acronym, PNW Cosmos is what it's called, um, between some colleges in our region. And the reason why I like this is we didn't just mentor Native students, we mentored their mentors. Their advisors who maybe did not have any, any experience working with Native students and said, this is what's important to us. This is what's important to your students. This is what's important to your community. So we took them on a field camp where, uh, on, on Nest Burst land, where they built, or they put up teepees. We also put them on a uh, float trip, and I've been on this for about four, four or five different years so far. So we, we pair the advisor and the student together, and we go on a rafting trip. And originally I thought, well, this is just one way to get National Science Foundation to pay for a rafting trip. Like, it's a good idea, but what's the purpose? Well, here's what I really like about it. If you're on a rafting trip, there's no access to cell phone, there's no access to internet, 
And at the end of the evening, you can't just go and hide in your hotel room. So you are forced to talk and converse and bring up different topics to see other point of views. It actually turns out to be very good to have that time isolated together to talk about what's important to Native people, what's, indig what's, what's Indigenous research methodologies, what's Native science, these sort of things. And the advisors begin to understand a little bit better their point of view of their students and help them uh, be able to graduate um, with their degrees. Okay, so again, I mentioned work with tribal colleges as well. One of, the, one of my trips where I went through and I said, what are some things that we can help you with? And they told me two things that were common things. One of them was, we need some professional development. So they wanted a chance to do some research. They wanted some chance to connect with the university. And so we established that. So we did professional development workshops with uh, tribal college faculty. So this is our first one that we did. We did it this past summer, and we have funding for one more summer to do these workshops with <coughs> tribal college faculty. The other thing that they asked for was faculty exchange. So in other words, they wanted faculty from the university to come and help teach classes on their campuses, and vice versa. They wanted some of their faculty to come and teach classes on the university campus too. And we're still working on that. Okay, I'm working on that proposal right now. We're going to try to submit that and see if we can get that um, money. So, sort of the end of my talk. Hopefully, you've been writing down questions. These are some of the areas that receive funding um, Inbury, uh, F Score, uh, the University of Montana, Montana Bureau, and the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'll go ahead and end. So, this is a picture of my. Um, Chanel, my grandparents, uh, before they uh, passed away, one of the last pictures I have of them. You've never seen the inside of a hogan, so here's the inside of a hogan. Usually there are beds on the outside. There's the fireplace in the middle uh, where they also cooked as well. So this is essentially where my, my grandparents grew up until like 2003. They lived in this hogan. Every time I went to go visit them, that's where I would go. We'd go visit them in the flats and in their hogan. So it's not that far off, okay? So, I, so someone mentioned last night when uh, they asked them, hey, so do you, do you live in a TV on the reservation? It's like, no, we live in a house, we have electricity, a direct TV. Well, <laughs> my grandparents didn't actually do that until about 2003. No running water, no electricity that they lived in. But that was their way of life, and that's what they enjoyed. So I, I appreciated them um, kind of letting, letting me know where it is that I came from as well. All right. I think that's what I'm talking about. I talked it up, so I appreciate your time.